You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in the nationalist news. These are the highlights of the news today, Friday the 22nd of February. A family affair, rape and torture of domestic slave, paid just £400 a year. Baffling police jargon in running for Golden Bull Award. Finally, jail for sham marriage lawyers. Muslims found guilty of UK terrorism charges. Hagia Sophia at the centre of looming Christian versus Islam dispute. Euro MEPs threat to block landmark budget deal unless Britain agrees to increase EU budget by billions. Nick Griffin, MEP, from the belly of the beast. Chinese state media threatens Britain with severe punishment. Dr William Kilpatrick warns Christian Americans are naive about Islam. Thought for the day, dating for the mature, warnings and laughs. And finally, it isn't necessarily a dog's life. UK News. A family affair, rape and torture of domestic slave pay just £400 a year. Ali Muddin, Mohammed, his wife, Shamina Yusuf, Mohammed's mother, Shanaz Begum, Begum's partner, Enkara Balapovi, and the family's optician, Shashi O'Brien, are being prosecuted in Croydon Crown Court for a number of charges that include trafficking, rape and exploitation. The victim is a 39-year-old mother of four from Hyderabad, who came to England after Mohammed successfully applied for her visa. The mother of four spent two years and eight months with Mohammed and his wife, where she was paid just £24 before allegedly being forced to move in with Mohammed's mother and her partner, who is accused of raping her. The court heard she was used as a sexual toy and general dog's body by an extended family and their friend who forced her to become their slave for a total of six years. She was threatened with murder if she complained. In a further testimony, the court was told she was scalded with boiling water, burned with a hot iron, beaten and threatened that her throat would be cut and her body buried in a back garden if she didn't do as she was told. After escaping the couple, she was then sent to live with an acquaintance of the family, optician Shashi O'Brien, 53, from Northwood, who was accused of assaulting her. Prosecutor Miss Caroline Hoey told the court, each of these defendants treated her with contempt, ignoring her basic rights and taking advantage of her naivety, her vulnerability and her ignorance. Most damning of all is the statement from the Daily Mail. Despite the woman approaching numerous agencies for help, Croydon Crown Court heard how the abuse continued. A nationalist spokesperson commented, This shows how the Muslims are now becoming virtually Teflon. Nothing sticks. Baffling police jargon in running for Golden Bull Award. Warwickshire police are in the running for the Plain English Golden Bull Award after publishing mission statement that in 1,200 words does not even mention the word crime once. According to the Coventry Telegraph, Chrissy Mayher, founder of the Plain English campaign, branded the script absolute rubbish, but Warwickshire police said it was not a public document despite being published online. Chrissy said it's absolute rubbish as far as I'm concerned, and this is from someone who has read reports day in, day out, for the last 30 years. How can I make an informed decision if they do not talk to me in plain English? Gobbledygook gives me no choice. Most of us do not use words like that. I'm not asking for cats that on the mat, but all familiar words seem to have been sieved out and all you are left with is a horrible mess. I can't understand any of it. It's being entered for our Golden Bull Award. If they win, they get a certificate. Speaking in general terms about the rising use of jargon by public organisations, such as the police, at the NHS and councils, she added, after 50 years it's the worst I've ever seen. They seem to want to cloud negative messages in jargon. It's a screen to hide behind. It just makes me think, what are they up to? What are they trying to cover up? A Warwickshire police spokesman said, we always welcome feedback in our communications. This document was prepared for an internal audience. <laughs> Finally, jail for sham marriage lawyers. The Daily Mail headline reads, Jail for 35 years. Gang who made £20 million fixing 2,000 sham marriages. 
Murderers, drug lords and money launderers given free entry to the UK by industrial scale racket. A lawyer and three accomplices were jailed yesterday for arranging 2,000 sham marriages that earned them 20 million. Tetvik Suleiman and his gang flew women into Britain from EU countries and in the former Soviet bloc to marry citizens from outside the EU. Most couples met on the day of the wedding and needed an interpreter to get through their marriage vows. Some of the grooms were dangerous career criminals from Albania suspected of murder, drugs trafficking and money laundering. But they won the right to live in the UK because of their EU wives. The scam, thought to be Britain's biggest marriage racket, ran on an industrial scale for eight years. Muslims found guilty of UK terrorism charges. On Thursday, the 21st of February, the British National Party carried the story making the news headlines of the day. Three Muslim men sought martyrdom by becoming suicide bombers and begin a huge campaign of carnage and destruction across the UK. They have been found guilty of terrorism charges. Ayfan Nasir, 31, Irfan Khalid, 27 and Ashik Ali, 27 from Birmingham were found guilty at Woolwich Crown Court of being central figures in the plan. That same evening, this World Today presenter listened to the ITV newsreader Mary Nightingale as ITV ensured their listeners heard vulnerable Muslims were targets of extremists in the same sentence as if to excuse the convicted terrorists' actions. Indeed, there is to be an inquiry held as to why vulnerable Muslims are being radicalised in the UK. BBC Radio 2 was carrying on the same theme earlier today where one of their presenters went on to describe these terrorists as akin to the recent British comedy film Four Lions, that is a jihad satire following a net group of homegrown terrorist jihadis from Sheffield, South Yorkshire, England. These terrorists were neither vulnerable nor comedic. They presented a very clear and present danger to the people of Britain, as demonstrated by Mr Justice Henrique, who told the, the trio that they will all face life in prison when they are sentenced in April or May. Addressing the seer, he said he had been convicted on overwhelming evidence and that he will face a very long minimum term. The judge said, you are a highly skilled bomb maker and explosives expert. Your mindset was similarly manifest. You sought to persuade others that a terror plot here in this country was by far preferable to fighting jihad abroad. The scale and extent of your ambition were similarly manifest. You were seeking to recruit a team of, of somewhere between six and eight suicide bombers to carry out spectacular bombing campaigns, one which would create an anniversary along the lines of 7-7 or 9-11, and it's clear you were planning a terrorist outrage in Birmingham. So once again, our own media is out in full force to excuse and downplay the seriousness of Islamic terrorism within our own country. Vulnerable. Not as vulnerable as the men, women and children would have been had these attacks gone ahead. European News The Hagia Sophia at the centre of looming Christian versus Islam dispute. The Hagia Sophia was, for 1100 years, the centre of Christendom in the East. With the arrival of Islam, it was converted to a mosque in 1453, and so it remained until 1931, following formation of the modern Republic of Turkey under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. In 1935, the Hagia Sophia, as part of the secularising campaign under the leadership of Ataturk, opened as a museum, and many of its marble floors and mosaics were seen for the first time in 500 years as carpets and white plaster covering the floors and walls were removed. Now, as part of Turkey's rapid pre-Islamization, it is a possibility that it will become a mosque again. Today, Turkey's government, whilst professing the same secular principles, has supported a campaign to build new mosques and convert some historic buildings into mosques. A proposal to make the Hagia Sophia a mosque is now under consideration in the Turkish parliament. Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew I of Constantinople has staked out his opposition to convert the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, saying, We want Santa Sophia to remain a museum. The Orthodox prelate said that if the museum is converted to any religious use, it should become a Christian church, since it was built for that purpose. Indeed. A World Date reporter comments, Well, if the Turks could show their goodwill by making it into a church again, as it was for a thousand years before the Ottoman jihadists turned it into a mosque when they conquered Constantinople. 
but I doubt they will show any leaning towards any tolerance of Christianity. Turkey, 17,000 new mosques built under Erdogan. Some 17,000 new mosques have been built during Turkish Premier Recep Tayyip Erdogan's 10 years of leadership. Milliet reports, in the same period the amount of public schools has remained at 32,000, while the number of mosques has jumped from 76,000 to 93,000. Turkey's secular opposition has accused Erdogan of having a secret plan to re-Islamize the nation. Erdogan recently announced the construction of a new mega-mosque in Istanbul, which will be seen from every corner of the Bosphorus and will have the tallest minarets in the world. Euro MEPs threat to block landmark budget deal unless Britain agrees to increase Euro budget by billions. The European Parliament last night threatened to veto a landmark deal on the next EU budget unless Britain and other member states agree to increase it by billions. During a stormy session, leading members of the Brussels Parliament lined up to criticise the deal struck by David Cameron earlier this month. But MEPs claim the cuts went too far and would threaten economic growth. Tory MP Mark Pritchard last night said it would be an outrage if MEPs blocked a deal agreed by all EU leaders. Yesterday, the Parliament's German Socialist President Martin Schulz suggested he was willing to take the nuclear option of blocking the deal agreed by 27 heads of government. He has already indicated that the vote, expected in the next few weeks, could be a secret ballot, allowing MEPs to defy instructions from their national governments with impunity. Writing in the Financial Times, Mr Schultz criticised the backward-looking deal, which will limit EU spending to £768 billion, some £68 billion less than the European Commission demanded. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, for his talk today from the belly of the beast. When I die, I intend to ask for time off my stint in purgatory on the grounds that, having attended hundreds of directorate, executive and similar meetings, I've already done a fair bit of time in hell. If my point is taken, I will be drawing particular attention to the time spent yesterday morning in a meeting about the funding of European level political parties and foundations with the European Parliament's directorate general of funding. If you're a fan of the Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister political satire series, you may have wondered on occasion if the scriptwriters aren't overdoing it a bit when they portray top-ranked civil servants droning away with impossible gobbledygook, which is used to conceal in plain sight the information really needed. Well, having sat through yesterday's session, I can assure you that, if anything, the TV comedy underestimates it. Still, I shouldn't complain, because one announcement that did come across very clearly is the fact that 604,000 euros from the European Parliament's 30 million euro 2013 funding pot for transnational parties is due to be deposited in the bank account of our Alliance of European National Movements early next week. Which means that at long last, millions of patriotic voters all over Europe will be getting another bit of the tax rebate in the form of support for the ideals they believe in instead of having their taxes given to parties to which they're utterly opposed, such as the communists. Still, as meetings go, I got far more from the dinner and breakfast discussions with two top members of Obama's internet campaign team that Clive Jefferson and I attended this week as guests of the European Internet Foundation. With the web now second only to TV as the most utilised source of information and news, this is an area which is becoming more important by the day. Surprisingly, only one other Brit, a socialist Scottish female of some sort or another, bothered to attend the main evening session which is their loss and our gain. We were given some very useful insights into cutting edge web campaigning. That said, Clive and I were both very pleased, but not too surprised, to find that the plans we have hammered out on in this field over the last few weeks are uncannily close to some of their main recommendations. More on this in due course, because I hope to have some very exciting news for you in this field before the end of this spring. The good news this week was the fact that the mainstream media are at last beginning to realise or perhaps to feel unable to conceal or deny any longer the fact that the British National Party hasn't gone away, isn't going away, and, in fact, is in the early stages of a stunning political comeback. Online news site politics.co.uk started the ball rolling by breaking the news that the latest quarterly returns published by the Electoral Commission show a massive increase in the donations to the BNP, over £7,500, that had to be declared to the Commission. 
over 700 percent increase, the site said. The BNP is building up a huge war chest, warned the report, which was promptly picked up by the Huffington Post, which commented on the surge in our income. The Times and The Independent also ran the story, explaining that a very significant part of the jump came from a record donation of £200,000 from London tube driver Albert Starmore, a loyal party member who sadly passed away last year. If the controlled media thought that was bad, just wait until they see the returns to you shortly, because they will show that there was still more to come from Mr Starmore's estate. And on top of that, our Treasury team is at present dealing with probate matters from two more substantial bequests. One of them, James Connolly, a retired train driver, and in another similarity to Albert, also a Londoner, though he spent his final years after retirement in internal exile in hideously unenriched Cornwall. The great news from the Treasury Department is that the number of members, supporters, and just members of the public who've made contact to arrange to leave either their full estates or a useful share to the British National Party has increased an incredible tenfold this year. Of course, this doesn't do anything to increase our current income, but it does bode very well for the future of the party and our long nationalist struggle. The rise is a clear indication both of the confidence once again flowing through the hearts and minds of our people in the British National Party and the growing popular anger at the political classes breaking of Britain and their relentless war against English community cohesion, identity and culture. The impact of this was highlighted this week when the media gave extensive coverage to the story that more than 600,000 real Londoners have quit our once great capital city in just five years of massive white flight. Albert Starmore and James Connolly were not the first, and they will certainly not be the last Londoners to remember the BNP in generous bequests that will one day be seen to have changed the course of British history. The reserve of burning anger over what they've done to us Londoners, yes, I count myself as one, will fuel a resistance even after death defiance that will go on topping up our BNP war chest for a generation to come. If you too want to fight on long after you're gone and to cause anguish squealing from beyond the grave in the controlled media for good measure, then call 0844 809 4581 straight away and take advantage of the BNP's new totally free and confidential will writing service in your own home accompanied by a visit from a senior member of our leadership team. Returning to my work this week, I'm particularly pleased with the latest issue of Freedom, which is now rolling off the press. It's a superb edition, covering, among many other things, the hugely important court victory by BNP bus driver Arthur Redfern. This legal triumph secures the right of everyone in the BNP and in Britain to be able to hold, express and campaign for our views without ever again having to fear for their jobs. Among the other subjects covered in an ultra lively issue are the first steps in our food aid initiative, the shocking truth about the condemn regime's bedroom tax and a timely expose of UKIP's stance in favour of mass third world immigration. Meanwhile, we're still signing up candidates for May's county council elections. With the BBC plugging their safety valve UKIP and Labour in opposition to a failing government, these are not going to be easy, but they will prove further that we haven't gone away. The final tranches of the bequest from Mr Starmore are not likely to come through before May, and nor will any of Mr Connolly's money. Their loyal generosity will make a big difference to what we can do in next year's European elections, but for this May, the answer to the question, will we have the money to put in a good showing, is for you to give. Please do what you can. Our localised leaflets will be going out in many areas with a big backup one on the bedroom tax. This grotesque attack on Britain's poor will penalise hundreds of thousands of grandparents, the disabled, separated parents and foster parents by turning the need for a so-called unused bedroom into the equivalent of parking on a double yellow line in front of one of those chippy Nigerian traffic wardens working on commission. With more than 600,000 British families already facing being pushed from their homes by bedroom taxes of over £700 a year, and Labour councils then eager to give the newly vacated properties to large families of immigrants, this is going to be a huge issue. We need to push to put the blame for this disgrace to Britain, not merely on the condemn regime in Westminster, but also on the Labour councillors falling over themselves to rake in money and destroy those remaining areas and estates they do not consider sufficiently enriched. This is really important, not just because such greed and cruelty is wrong in itself, but also because if we can inflict enough pain on them, the political elite may yet think long and hard 
before rolling out the bedroom tax on all homes, including those of working taxpayers and pensioners, because, make no mistake, that is their aim. Just like Scotland with the poll tax in the 1980s, those on benefits are being used as guinea pigs. If the right wing of the establishment's one party state gets away with using it to screw poor social housing tenants, then its left wing will, within a couple of years, move to screw taxpayers in private rented and owner occupied houses. After all, they'll say, it's only fair that everyone should pay the bedroom tax. Well, I beg to differ. Our homes should be our castles. Those in larger ones already pay extra through their steadily rising council tax. Why the devil should we have to pay more just so that council chief executives can keep their inflated salaries and pet projects such as translation services? If you agree with me, then please decide right now to help to do something about it. Many thanks, Nick. As usual, very informative and interesting. World News. Chinese state media threatens Britain with severe punishment. Senior British leaders should avoid pointless posturing over issues including human rights and Tibet or face the consequences the Global Times warned. The editorial followed reports last weekend of a split in the cabinet with William Hague, the Foreign Secretary, and Nick Clegg arguing that Britain should take a firmer line with China. If Britain and China start competing over who can be tougher against the other, can Britain be the winner? The editorial asked. Dr. William Kilpatrick warns that Christian Americans are naive about Islam. WorldNetDaily.com carries a stark warning from noted Catholic psychologist Dr. William Kilpatrick. Dr. Kilpatrick, who is a speaker and writer, taught at Boston for 33 years. He is warning that Christian Americans are naive about Islam and working towards their own extinction. Kilpatrick, author of Christianity, Islam and Atheism, The Struggle for the Soul of the West, said alarms should be sounding. Kilpatrick told World Net Daily, We often hear that the true Islam is a religion of peace that has been hijacked by a minority of violent extremists. If that is true, why not open the books on Islam? Islam deserves the kind of inspection and scrutiny that Christianity has received for decades. Muhammad said he came as a, a warner, wrote Kilpatrick in his book, published in November. Among the banners that can be seen in various Muslim demonstrations in Europe is one that reads, Islam, our religion today, your religion tomorrow. For anyone who follows the pronouncement of Islamic religious authorities around the world, there can be little doubt that this is their goal. Kilpatrick chronicles Islam's war on Christian civilization as a war on universal human rights. He cites three factors working against all people of goodwill. Cowardice or malice by secular governments, naive Christian leaders, and irreligious or atheist news media preaching indifference. Kilpatrick likewise criticised American President Obama's policy towards the Islamic world, saying, in our failure to understand Islam, we've helped to bring to power some of the most extreme Islamists, such as the Muslim Brotherhood. Convert to Christianity, Wilders tells Muslims, all Muslims should renounce their religion immediately in favour of Christianity or atheism. It would be better for them and for everyone else, controversial Dutch politician Gert Wilders said in Melbourne on Monday. Insisting politely that he did not want to incite or offend anyone, the anti-Islam campaigner described the Prophet Muhammad as a warlord, terrorist and paedophile, and urged Australia to ban the Koran and all migration from Muslim countries. Since Premier Ted Ballou had advised Victorians to ignore Mr Wilders, he said the Premier could ignore the threat of Islam and sing Kumbaya all day long, but the voters would wake up eventually. Wilders was in Melbourne to speak as part of his Australian tour to speak on the perils of Islam. The Dutch MP received two standing ovations from a crowd of over 600 in Melbourne during an hour-long speech in which he depicted a grim future for Australia under the rule of Islamic law. The tour is organised by the Q Society, a society of Australians who believe in the equality of men and women, a fair go for everyone, and a civil and democratic society based on classical European foundations. North Korea threatens final destruction of South Korea. North Korea threatens South Korea with final destruction during a debate at a UN conference on disarmament on Tuesday, saying it could take second and third steps after a nuclear test last week. As the saying goes, a newborn puppy knows no fear of a tiger. 
South Korea's erratic behaviour would only herald its final destruction, North Korean diplomat John Yong Ryong told the meeting. Without specifically referring to the nuclear test, John said North Korea had recently taken a resolute step for self-defence, which he described as strong counteractions to a foreign aggressor. Now my thought for the day. Dating for the mature, warnings and laughs. Now because we're in for a cold, wintry weekend and we all need a few laughs or chuckles, I'm going to go completely off topic from Islam, nationalism and our country. I think from time to time we all need a break and a sense of humour without which most of us nationalists would chuck the towel in, I can tell you. Now the subject I'm going to talk about is dating for the mature. And I mean mature, not positively crumbling. Some 20 years ago, when I was mature and not crumbling, I went on Dateline. In fact, that was how I met my present husband. I hate that word partner. It could and does mean anything from tennis to life. I believe in the old days before the wheel and indeed the dawn of time, Dateline was operated via the post, but the details filled in were put in what would now be museum exhibits of old computer systems. There was no such thing as computer dating and dating over the web in the UK then, I believe. I had been working full-time for many years, and my last job was in a large blue-chip company. I was widowed, my two eldest children had fled the nest, and my youngest was away at college. I was in my mid-forties, and as my only relative was my mummy, who lived on the coast, weekends were becoming lonely affairs. I had just finished a six-year engagement, and believe me, in a small house... There are not enough chores to do or gardens to maintain, so I found myself talking to myself and actually giving myself the answers. Now that is bad, my friends. So I saw the advert for Dateline, got my form, filled in the details and sent it off. Eureka! Within a week I had a list of six guys, their addresses and phone numbers. Wahey! Well, off I went. Froggy would a wooing go. I was filled with enthusiasm, fear and hope and a weird idea I was doing something really very daring and off the charts. My friends, female, decided I was quite mad, as picking up guys at a bar or disco was the norm. And I had nothing against that, just that if you have a guy's address and phone number, he isn't a complete stranger. Which in some cases, whatever you pick up at a bar or disco, he can tell you any story he likes. Apart from that, although my younger friends took me out for an airing once a month to the local disco, I did feel that my discoing days were coming to an end, especially when some prat decided he wanted to dance with me and we were the only ones on a very highly lighted floor and he was doing the Paso Doble or something similar. I just wanted the ground to open up, but of course it didn't. Thus, the foray into Dateline. At least I would see what I was taking on, or rather, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Oh dear, and what a foray those first weeks were. I made the decision that I would meet this new band of hopefuls at a local cocktail bar in a large hotel, or rather I'd meet them in the car park, which was very well lit, and I was known there as I arranged conferences and hotel facilities as part of my job for my company. Now apparently in those days the guys didn't bother to ring the women, because there were so many on the loose and not enough men. One man told me later that most of the men had answer phones to cope with the demand. Very flattering. Anyway, I rang up the first guy on my cherished list and we arranged to meet. Well, I sat in my car and watched as this huge automobile swept in. Very nice, I thought. Roll on the champers. And then he got out. Now, bear in mind, although mature, I did look a lot younger than my years and filled in my form accordingly. What got out was really very odd. He was minute, and I mean very short. He was a lot older than I envisaged and obviously very wealthy. I did the usual, I made all the right noises and off we went to the bar. At this stage I was gasping for a very large drink, but I thought it unwise so had a small white wine. After several of these I still didn't mellow and he didn't look any younger or taller. He was very nice, very old, very kind and loaded. What was wrong? Everything. He really wanted someone to look after him in his dotage blessing, and I was not, and still am not, that way inclined. 
We had a very nice evening and I then told him we were not really suited, but it had been very pleasant. I went home, looked in the mirror and thought, oh my God, what have I let myself in for? Next weekend, I contacted another. A meeting followed and there are more of them. Wealthy, old, short guys driving cars much bigger than themselves. And in one case, one gentleman had blocks on the pedals of his Merc because he was so vertically challenged. He showed me this with great pride as it had cost him a lot of money. Now, I'm nothing against short men, but in general, I like to look up to a man rather than look down to one. After around a couple of months of dealing with the short single geriatrics of the UK in general, I thought that something was a bit odd. I rang a very nice lady up in Dateline and asked her what had gone wrong. She checked my form and said that they were adhering to the details I'd put in for the men I wanted to meet. I remember saying laughingly, well, why are they all so short and so old? She said that was what was on my form. Should she read it out? Well, to explain to you all, as if you didn't know, figures are not my forte. I am dyslexic with figures, as many of my bank managers can testify. Well, you could have scraped me off the carpet when she read out what I had submitted to the computer, which in no way was to blame for my entering the world of the mini-men. I had apparently put that I wanted to meet four foot sixty year olds when in fact i really wanted to meet six foot forty year olds thus the mickey rooney geriatrics as opposed to the possible jeff goldblums the dayline lady had to pick herself up off the floor as well we were laughing so much of course she amended it and reset me out another list as i had waded my way through two lists of little old men by then then I started on the amended list of the younger, higher variety kind of guy. Although not in the same league as my elderly pygmy guys, I did meet some very odd males in the year I paid for. I also acted as a filter for Dateline because we were then encouraged to report back to the agency and some of those conversations should have been recorded for posterity. I kept my workplace agog with the annals of the Mozar on the hunt. I met a man who wanted to drive me out to the country to be alone with me and turn nasty when I wouldn't leave the bar. There was a very nice man whose wife had died and he brought along her dog. We went along to another pub as dogs were not allowed in the usual bar and we sat outside and of course it started to rain, in fact pour. So there I was, sitting with a dead woman's dog in my lap, under a small umbrella, listening to her husband, talking about her non-stop, with the doggy, who was lovely, eating my crisps, with rain pouring down my neck. I met a fellow who had the fear of God put into him because his last dateline date had met him at the door stark naked, and he clearly had been very adversely affected. I met a very nice man who just lost his wife with cancer, and he had two grown-up boys. It was obviously too soon to even attempt dating. On the second date, he took me home to meet the boys, who were lovely, but he had photos of his wife enshrined all over the place, and I decided I was not the right material to wear her shoes. She looked lovely, and they were so happy. It was a very, very sad meeting. I later learnt from him that he was marrying her nurse, which I think was the best course of action. I met a guy who insisted on relaying to me over dinner his entire life history with women and what they'd done to him, and at the end of it, I wished someone had killed him, thus relieving me of the wish to do so. Until I met my tall American from the Deep South, I think I met every sort of abnormal, unsuitable, very nice, unhappy, very happy, mad, sane, fat, thin, tall, medium, well-dressed, shabby, no money, loads of money, mean, generous, bald, hairy, successful, divorced, never been married, still married, just lying, misogynistic, not sexual at all, political, apolitical, just raving, hurt, damaged, wanting to hurt or damage, obsessed, vacant, nice and kind characters. I even met the TV writer Ashley Farrow, who was very interesting. He wanted to write, but still worked in the weather office in Bracknell at that time. Not my cup of tea. Met many guys who seemed to live their lives around their grown-up daughters, which didn't appeal to me at all. I've got enough with my own children, let alone someone else's, and I don't share. I'm a very bad sharer. I met captains of industry and governments, although these were mostly in the first dwarf weeks, as I call them, or rather where I was shortchanged. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. All in all, it was an experience I wouldn't have missed, and it was very useful. 
because it isn't until you are mature and meet all and sundry that you can find yourself and know what you not necessarily want but need. Remember to all mature ladies out there, you can overlook a lot of faults over a nice dinner with lots of wine, but it's in the cold light of day and the ordinary things in life that are not romantic that the right partner will find you. I would always recommend marriage agencies, dating agencies, speed dating, whatever it takes to get you out and about and meeting for the most part, unsuitable and hilarious dates, because they will always form the basis of what you don't want, and that is just as important as what you think you want. Not so sure about web dating because I've never done that. Just Dateline, and in the end, it was certainly worth it. Especially in today's mantra, which idealises the single career woman, and some women are fine on their own, but even more are not. Women over a certain age, or past their sell-by date, are becoming, with the help of the media and fashion, not needed in society or the world today. I challenge that. The most enduring of cultures have the three ages of women that are vital, child, maiden and crone. Having reached the crone stage, I ain't giving up yet, and just because you may be over the hill, love or something near it is not out of the question for anyone. And finally, it ain't all a dog's life. It's been reported by the Telegraph that a stray that helped save the lives of two soldiers in Afghanistan and survived capture by the Taliban, is one of the five canine heroes chosen to help launch this year's Crufts Dog Show. Bryn, a local breed known as the Coochie Tiger, was adopted by the British Army when he was found starving and abandoned outside a base in Helmand in 2010. The soldiers discovered he had an inborn talent for sniffing out danger, and soon he began accompanying patrols around the area. It was during these patrols that he saved the lives of two soldiers when he barked to alert them to a hidden bomb that would have killed them. He was then captured by the Taliban during a raid and remained with them until later that year when a daring mission was mounted by Afghanistan special forces against the Taliban and Bryn was found. Still, it was not over for poor Bryn and he faced being left behind and killed when the unit flew home. So a campaign that went worldwide was mounted to save him and he was brought back to the UK by Now Z Dogs Charity. He now tours the country with his new owner, Sally Borwin, raising money to help the shelter in Afghanistan. Miss Borwin of Hailsham, East Sussex, said, Despite being left starving and abandoned, he found new humans to love and saved the soldiers' lives. Well, a dog is a man's best friend, and this doggy has survived not only bombs and cruelty, but Islam, which is a feat in itself. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy, safe and warm weekend. <laughs>